So you evaluated over 8,000 foods and drinks. And if I'm correct, each each food and, and, and drink that was evaluated within the, the food compass was scored between 1 and 100. And there was a, an algorithm that was kind of uh, behind that calculation, which, which factored in all of these things that you're talking about, um, which you built on the basis that there was better science or more up-to-date science that could be used to create a system that would improve upon what is already out there. Can you, can you elaborate any further on, you know, at a high level, what that algorithm looks like, what, what were yeah. the, the, the various kind of domains and, and bits of information that were being pulled on? Yeah, so we put together a really good scientific team, you know, researchers who studied global nutrition, who studied um, kind of phenolics and bioactives, epidemiologists, economists, to really say, like, let's start with the science and what would we build if we could start de novo? And so we we built a system that scores foods across nine domains or areas. And so I think that's first important is the other scoring systems just the, the points are added up in kind of one bucket. We have nine buckets. And what's why that's important is it makes it harder for industry to game the system because if there's nine domains that, that each contribute to the score, you could change the food to change one domain, but if you don't change the other eight domains, you're not going to change the score that much. And so it, it really helps kind of stabilize the score and prevent industry from, from, from gaming the system. And so I won't go through all the nine domains, but I'll go through some of the ones that seem to be the most important. And so one of the domains we we, we created, which is really pretty new, was a domain around overall carb quality, overall fat quality, and overall mineral quality. And so how did we, we judge those three things? We judged overall carbohydrate quality using the ratio of fiber, dietary fiber to total carbohydrate. And other papers that have been published the reason that works is it kind of gives you a rough estimate of the whole grains and bran versus refined starch and sugar in a food. And why the carb to fiber ratio works well, it works better say than just added sugar is because again, it it starts to capture the refined starch, not just the the sugar, the refined grains, and it gives positive points for whole grains and and, and bran. That kind of gives it one overall measure of, of carb quality. As an overall measure of fat quality, we looked at the ratio of unsaturated fat to saturated fat. And so that's more meaningful than just saturated fat alone is kind of the ratio, the relative amount of healthy fats you're getting versus saturated fat. And then for sodium, we looked at the ratio of sodium to potassium, the, the kind of the mineral quality, because there's really good evidence that sodium raises blood pressure and raises risk of stroke, but potassium counteracts that. And so um, you don't want to judge a food that has, let's say, 200 milligrams of sodium the same if it has no potassium or if it has 200 milligrams of potassium too, right? You should get a food that also has some potassium that will offset some of the harms of sodium. So that was one domain, the nutrient ratio domain. Another domain we did had food ingredients. And so, for example, the amount of beans, the amount of fruits, the amount of whole grains, the amount of yogurt uh, in a food. Uh, another domain we had was was vitamins, and so multiple vitamins um, that could that could you know get positive scores if there's more vitamins. But we only picked a few vitamins for each food, or we or we only allowed the top vitamins for each food to give positive points to to prevent gaming the system from fortification. If you just poured vitamins into a food, right, and made all, multiple high, it wouldn't give that many extra points. You could only you could go so high. We did another one with with minerals, um, um, things like magnesium and calcium and other minerals. We also had a domain on processing, and I think this was really important. For the first time in a, in a food rating system, we incorporated um, the Brazilian uh, system, which gave negative points to ultra-processed foods. And so even if all the nutrients look the same and all the in- ingredients look the same, if it was more processed, it, it got negative points. And we also gave positive points to fermentation, as I mentioned earlier, you know, something that we think is is potentially good good for good for health for food. So those are just some examples. And so overall we had about 50 different attributes we measured across these nine domains. And importantly, I, I just want to, I'm sure we'll get into this more, Simon, but I just want to emphasize that this was a research project, right? Trying to see if we could figure out if this system worked better. We came up with the principles ahead of time. We applied the principles and then we saw how it worked and we published the paper. We said, here's what we found. Here's what it looks like. And we compared it to Nutriscore, 
uh, and the health jar rating uh, as as two of the you know most common systems. Mm-hmm. And I think there might be some some confusion about this, but I had seen some people suggesting this was the food industry they were behind this and creating this as a kind of way to self regulate. Is that is that accurate? So one of the faculty members on the project, in term, when we were getting you know funding for the project, did get funding support from Danone, um, and so Danone did partially support the project. I didn't receive myself any research funding from from, from Danone, but some of, one of the faculty members got a grant. And the reason for that was Danone at the time, which is a big European company, was facing a decision about whether or not to use Nutriscore in Europe because Nutriscore was being pushed in, in Europe. And, and I think Danone didn't love Nutriscore because of some of the limitations it had. Um, interestingly, while they funded the, the project, while we were doing the research, they decided to use Nutriscore. And so they used Nutri- Danone now <coughs> voluntarily reports Nutriscore on the front of PAC. So Danone funded the project. The National Institutes of Health also provided some, some funding for the project through an, an existing grant. But in both cases, the research was totally initiated by the research investigators. It was our idea. It was our plan. We developed the protocol. We developed the science. We did the analysis. We interpreted it and we published it. um, And they had no role in any of that. Um, And so um, I think Danone had interest, you know, given that they have some healthier products like, like, you know, unsweetened yogurt. Could we come up with a better system? And so I think they were interested in supporting our, our, our research. But it, this wasn't a food industry product. This was a scientific product created by a university with mm-hmm. joint funding from food industry and from uh, the National Institutes of Health. 